Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Film Seizure and the conclusion of my uh, curated month of the also rans uh, during the uh, various uh, the four decades or five decades worth of also rans in the best picture category, meaning the, the films that didn't win but might be worth talking about. With me, as always, Chuck Moore. Chuck, how's it going? Good. How are you, Jeffrey? Hey, I am doing doing swell, doing great, doing Good. great. Jason Oliver is the other member of our trio. How's it going? I'm doing great. Hmm. You sound like you're doing great. That's great. Great. I'm you're great. great. I'm just great. I'm a little. I'm a little like, I don't know. I didn't expect this one to be so heavy, and I also just got done watching another thing. Because I don't have we said what we're watching today. Oh, not yet. I'm getting there. Yeah, I'm just a little like I don't know, melancholy, a little, a little, dra- a little drain, a little yeah, a little drained, a little a little emotionally drained. Okay. Well, this week we close things out with 2005's Capote, directed by Bennett Miller. Who, um, by the way, he's directed three narrative movies and a documentary and he's been nominated for best director twice yeah it's pretty good yeah that's pretty good track record there track Um, record and the other one was for a movie the uh steve carell movie right um fox catcher fox catcher which i never watched and now i need to it's really good yeah yeah well uh this guy doesn't make many movies but when he does um they turn out to be pretty good yeah, they, well, he made Moneyball also. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is uh, Capote. Now, <laughs> by total accident, I think I mentioned this last week, we, uh, we had a 1967 movie followed by 75, 85, 95, and 2005. I should have picked something from 1965 instead, but eh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Holy I, I well, I picked five movies I thought were that were worth talking about. And no oh boy, I do think this one is worth talking about. Um, I will also say, probably of the movies that were previously picked, this one I think is kind of in the same sphere as Babe, where it would have been compared to what it was nominated against it might have been a it, it might have been a weird win right yeah. if it won best picture but i do think without a single doubt in my friggin mind that this has the best performance out of everything we watched <clears throat> i was just trying to think what would be the pick from 1965 and i would guess maybe dr Zhivago. Probably. That's my mom's favorite movie. Sound of Music won that year. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, this one, uh, so Capote was up against uh, Brokeback Mountain, Crash, which won, Good Night and Good Luck in Munich. And that goddamn Kathleen Kennedy getting another Oscar nomination. Uh, we should really we should really consider the grift, is what I'm saying. Those people make a lot of money just bitching about her constantly. Anyway, um I, Crash I will, I will say, have a fucking plan, Kathleen. <laughs> don't don't take one of the biggest franchises in movie history and not have a fucking plan. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Hey, She's such our a bank great project account- manager, have a plan. <laughs> our bank account just went up a few bucks <laughs> keep it up anyway um crash is often considered one of the worst best yeah, pictures that's a bad movie I, I remember being emotionally manipulated by that movie when it came out and liking it quite a bit and then revisiting it several years later and thinking what the hell was i thinking i think well, a lot of people had that same feeling because i remember liking it too yeah and then i tried to watch it with step i think and she's like this is shit and i'm like you're right it's shit <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean brokeback mountain should have been the winner this year probably i don't know um, i could have I, I could i could pick this or Brokeback oh, mountain, i mean yeah i mean 
these were the two i mean those that one and capote were probably the two best movies of that year and i did like munich quite a bit um but it is it's a steven spielberg movie it, it's you know so for what, what else? was the other All one? The, what was the other one good night and good luck oh it's great too yeah um by the way interestingly munich uh one of the people in that movie is daniel craig who plays perry smith the following year in the movie infamous where uh, toby um what's his face um toby is it jones what, what is his last name anyway he played capote sandra bullock okay. played harper lee okay i think that's the one i've seen I think that's the one I've seen because I I've always imagined Toby Jones as as Truman Capote. Which he is, won't anymore. <laughs> but I don't remember that one at all. But right. that must be why I have have Toby Jones in my mind. And if you look at Truman Capote, like oh my god, like he looks yeah. like Toby Jones, like just like him. It's kind of wild. I well, um, I just watched what is the name of the movie? Murder by Death. I think, which is like a 60s or 70s, like, clue kind of comedy movie, and Truman Capote's in it. And Philip Seymour Hoffman does him pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'm really not saying well. he, he does a lot but like I mean, him, like, too. But I mean, like, looks, just natural looks, those two, like, look very alike. Anyway. Yeah. But yes, um, I forgot about that movie. Yeah, that's um, the one I haven't seen. I have seen this movie, but not that one. <laughs> um so I can't, I can't imagine Sandra Bullock as Harper Lee is very good. I just yeah, I can't imagine. Well, okay, Catherine Catherine Keener as Harper Lee is really good. Yeah, yeah. especially like after seeing this, like she's great. Was she nominated? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's good. Um. So yeah. So I picked this for a couple of reasons. Number one, Philip Seymour Hoffman's really really good in this movie. Um. And the story of Truman Capote's uh, work with In Cold Blood is one of those things that is super duper, super duper, super duper fascinating to me. Um, I even have like a speculative graphic novel that is, uh, I think it's called Capote in Kansas or something like that. It's, it's something like that where, you know, where he's, like where it's more of kind of a uh, uh, fictionalized take on Capote. Um, so yeah, it's it, to me, it is, I almost think that that is more interesting than the crime that in cold blood talks about is, and that's super interesting too. <laughs> um, but most people, I don't think, realize that in cold blood is really the original true crime novel i think one of you yeah. know that i think a yeah. lot of people know that that's what well, it was famous for there was one a few years earlier that isn't exactly about a murder necessarily but it is a true crime kind of story but yeah i mean i think truman capote is thought of as like the inventor even as mentioned in the movie yeah um, it's a different type of crime. novel yeah yeah um i mean i've never read i've never read it in cold blood but i i knew that i knew that it was it was revolutionary for its non-fiction style of prose yeah or fictional style prose but a, in a non-fiction subject yeah a yeah. non-fiction novel is that what they called it in the movie yeah yeah, yeah. and the um uh the only true crime book to sell more then in cold blood is helter skelter hmm. and so yeah so those are two of the most like i mean and to be honest with you go beyond that that genre they're two of the most highly sold books ever um, well, i'm guessing anyone who picks up true crime in the last 20 years is it's really kind of jumped up right like yeah especially with television and books like has probably gone back to read in cold blood keeping oh. it a relevant book sure yeah i mean and and who doesn't get a little fascinated with with the uh, manson too you know so right. it, it's yeah it kind of makes sense um but anyway um yeah so i mean 
this is a topic that I find really, really fascinating. And I was a little surprised, Jason, that you had not seen this movie before. You know, I, I don't know. I just, I thought I did, but I hadn't. Um, but I was, I'm familiar enough with In Cold Blood. And I just rewatched In Cold Blood again today. I decided to put it on and, and I like finished it mere minutes before we jumped on this call or this, this recording. Um, but I didn't realize that the movie was essentially just, it really did. It, I was expecting more of a biopic, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised they call it than, Capote than yeah. like something more central to the murders. Right. 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 I didn't, I wasn't expecting it to, to solely focus on in cold blood. Um, which was fascinating. Uh, well, I think I agree. I agree. I think that his role in <laughs> in the whole entire affair is far more interesting than the affair itself. It's almost like any sense. old old murder in any small town. Mm-hmm. Just it happened to catch Capote's attention, and he made it national. Kind of. I yeah. mean, it was a national story. Obviously, it was on the New York Times front page. But sure, he made it bigger. By his actions yeah yeah and i think he just raised a lot of interesting questions right um i wasn't expecting as sober a examination of the death penalty that that that, that it was i wasn't expecting that um between both movie but between both the movie adaptation in cold blood and then capote i felt both were were essentially like trying to get at this moral psyche of America, right? Um, and examine, you know, what, what's the real root cause of this? And are we just in this perpetuation that we can never get out of? And I think a lot of that bears out. It's almost more relevant now than ever, right? Um, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, just, yeah. Well, and and then and yet there's another layer to it too as we'll as we'll talk about that what exactly was capote doing here right like he's 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 dancing on both sides of the line for sure because he wants his book and i do think that there are occasional signs that he does care about these two Mm -hmm. but it almost he almost only like it's something that changes from one moment to the next too well it's one thing i appreciate most about this movie because it is titled capote it's at least from what we know very very honest Mm -hmm. about him like it doesn't make him a hero no it doesn't it it doesn't do things that you would expect, like a sensationalize his involvement or his relationships or like, I think it's as honest as it can be with those two sides of the, the story. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, we meet him in something that we'll see him do many more times over, which is self aggrandizing himself. <laughs> right. It's all um, he does. It's all he does. Right. I mean, to the point where Harper Lee calls him out on it like in her own way but in a way that he still kind of just eh, yeah you know whatever you know uh it's uh, it's it's just all of it is fascinating <laughs> right so i guess we we'll, we'll, i guess a good place to start is with the 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 clutter family murder um, this was a, a November night where, um, two guys pull up to their house late at night. There are a, a husband, a wife, and two teenage kids, a boy and a girl. And, um, the guys believe that this farmer has money, um, and has a lot of cash, uh, particularly cash inside a, uh, a, uh, safe in the wall, um, that they want and one thing leads to another which leads to another to the point where all four of them get killed three of them are shot with shotgun one of them uh throat slit 
and the two guys that did it take what they can and they leave. Um, when it's a month and a half before they're caught um, in real life, uh, they are <laughs> they are caught initially for driving a stolen car and passing bad checks. And then it's the it's their description as the all points bolt, and that leads it back around to oh, oh, these are our guys, right. um, which is which the tip off comes from an inmate that they served with. These guys, uh, you know, they, they these guys were just on parole. They're just guys who are out looking to make some money or get some money somehow. Right. Um, they are two very different characters um and jason i'm glad you also watched uh in cold blood because it, perry is played as this kind of deeper thinking kind of uh head in the clouds type person which i think is probably 100 percent truman capote kind of bolstering that a little bit um whereas the other guy hickok uh, it seems like just the, I don't know. He kind of just comes off as like a, a scoundrel, really. Um, not that he's not dangerous, but he's he, there doesn't seem to be as much to him. Well, if you don't know this, the movie, he seems like the more dangerous one. He seems like it, it. it seems like yeah. Perry Perry would be the one that was kind of along for the ride, and things happened that he didn't want to happen right so he does like ricardo as he calls him does seem like the dangerous hothead that would have shot this entire family and slit someone's throat right um for me it kind of, it kind of there's it kind of begs the question because we find out obviously that perry is the one who killed them all um well, that's still sort of disputed, but I I think it's pretty certain that's what happened. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's kind of like man, that's it's it. Yeah, I it, it guess you're not really sure, um, and either the movie Capote or the or In Cold Blood, it's like they're they're basing the the, the evidence they have in the trial and what was said in the confessions and what was said to Truman, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it does seem that, yeah, Perry did them all. And it's kind of crazy that um, the other guy, what's his name? Um, Dick Hickok. Dick Hickok. You know, yeah, that's a name. And only nowadays, you know, that that would, he'd get like second degree or something like that. Right? Yeah. He wouldn't get the death penalty. Um, but he was like right there with them got the exact same punishment well he was the one who brought them to that house he was the one that uh that the inmate told that guy has money yeah. i used to work for him and go and get it not realizing no he doesn't have actual cash he writes checks right you can't you know it's right. like you can't take the checks you know so it's like he for does someone, have money and for someone who knows how to pass bad checks he should have known that right <laughs> right yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i guess i mean you know, that's kind of your premeditation right right is, is that whole thing but um I, I found it interesting in the movie there's a line where it was um some sort of uh, behavioral psychologist examined them both and determined that neither one of them could have done this on their own but together they formed a kind of third personality that was capable of, of the occurrence of, of well, yeah, they're like each other's, uh, X factors, you know? Yeah. I thought that that was an interesting, an interesting, uh, point, but, um, yeah, I just, I don't really know how to approach this movie. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so good. Like, it's so good. It really is. It, it was like jaw droppingly good. Um, but it's like really heavy stuff. And yeah. Well, it's uh, and it's so, hard to, and it's hard like it's such a like a what's the what's the term for it when it's a unreliable unreliable narrator, right? It, it, yeah. I feel like there's an unreliable narrator 
thread throughout this thing because obviously Truman Capote is looking to sell a book, write beautiful prose, you know, tell this novelized version of, of the events that he sees as they happen. But, you know, will we ever really know, right? Um, I think the movie does a good job, though, in that thread of making Perry seemingly manipulatable mm -hmm. while also being manipulative mm -hmm. of yes. truth. So you never really know mm -hmm. where the truth is yeah. with either of them. So it doesn't even matter what Truman said because Perry probably fed him lies too yeah, to sure. get him to do what he wanted him to do until it didn't matter anymore and which is when is he gives that, him the truth right there is like a little Not bit to get of too battle, far ahead but battle of wits right yeah 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 it's <laughs> kind of like sound silence of the lambs or something yeah. <laughs> and there's a there's even the line where truman capote says um i feel like we grew up in the same house but i went out the front door and he went out the back right yeah, he sees he sees himself in Perry, kindred spirits in a way. Yeah, yeah. and it and it's like this is the way my life could have gone, but I yeah, took a different path. So he's I think he's internally, you know, wrestling with that idea. It's like how far am I? What, was I away from being just like Perry, right? Um, and why is it Perry and not me? And that's like some really heavy shit to kind of deal with psychologically. Well, that also takes uh, Harper Lee aback a little bit, that too. Does. It does. Um, but, yeah, so, like, he, he, in truth, Capote spoke a lot to both guys. In, yes. this, in this movie, and certainly with how at least the movie version of In Cold Blood plays out, it does seem like Perry is the person he's most interested in yeah and i do think and because it, he and harper lee Catherine keener show up at their arraignment and he is surprised to hear that they wave perry well but that perry also is using words differently right um I don't know if it was necessarily correct, but he was using it differently. You have it? it, it I forget the word, but it did mean rush along. So it okay. was used correctly, the the word that was said. I can't remember what he said, though. Oh, yeah, I, I, don't. I remember. Um, I, th I think I made a note of that, too. I can't. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it written down. Oh, okay. it, did, it, it, was, it was the correct use. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I couldn't quite hear what he said, but I know that. Capote repeated it and took interest in it because um, he also Kate or something like that. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then later he even uses exasperate correctly. And then yeah. but he also Perry also likes to kind of prove to Capote that he's more intelligent than you might think, because he also defines the words that he uses too. Um which is great because Capote allows it for a long yeah. time until it's not yeah, until, disturbing him anymore. Until he gets to the point where he just wants what happened the That's night what of I November love about 14th. These and two, I, yep. is that they're both giving in a way and they're both manipulate. I'll probably say this way too many times, but the manipulation between the two is so well done in this movie that it's kind of astounding because it's never yep. stale. Right. It always feels genuine almost from both sides too. Well, and every time... I mean, this is a weird thing to say, but, but stick with me here. Every time Capote and Perry are talking to one another, it's something completely different than the last time they speak. It, the, every scene between the two of them is fresh. I want to see the next time they're together again. Does that make sense? Right. There's, gro there's growth. Mm -hmm. I think in their relationship, there's growth in topic. There's growth in what they're willing to share with one another until again there's a boiling point of the give and take that just they're both like nope yeah can't this is it yeah. yep we're done um yeah it's um the word was effectuate effectuate, effectuate. thank you okay yeah um, force or operation 
Okay. Effect, effectuate the waiver. Yeah. That, okay. Says, okay. When they waived their um, their rights their, to their, preliminary their, trial. Their rights for preliminary trial. Yes. To which Capote rightfully asks, "Why? Why would they do that? Why? What is it? Well, why? Because at this point, I mean, first of all, let, let's not confuse." Thing. These are two bad dudes, you know, and and they they did commit a murder. Four. Seeming, say what? Four of them, <laughs> yeah, right? And yeah. pretty awful too. But they should still have all the all the rights that they're promised, and to be suggested by a lawyer or by their defense attorney to give those up. That seems not right. And told told it's to it curry, supposedly to curry favor with the judge, but it's like, yes. what's that really going to do? Especially when you find out the judge isn't even responsible for sentencing. Exactly, the jury was. The jury was in Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's yeah? It's it, it it definitely feels like an umbrage. Yeah, it, so it seems like those... it, it seems like the defense attorney kind of wants them to pay for what they already know they've done. You know, like. It doesn't seem like this guy is going to even try to make sure, well, should they get the death penalty? Should they get life in prison? Is there something that w technically was wrong with everything? You know, it's, yeah. Well, this is what's wild about our system, and we could probably talk about this for ages, right? Their, their guilt is never really a question by anyone, but since they waived the rights on the advice of counsel, Capote is like, hey, he shouldn't have told you that. I think you should appeal, and I'm going to help you find a lawyer. Right. And in reality, these guys should never have had a chance, right? Like death penalty, I, I won't argue that they should get the death penalty. I never would. But at the same time, like to potentially have all charges dropped or whatever could happen through appeals from mishandling from counsel is insane to me. Right. Yeah. But it's... It, it goes along in this movie for quite a while with appeals. Yeah, it's five, now, five, five years yeah. of appeals. Um, and at first, you know, Truman is using that to his advantage. It's buying him more time. Right. Because he has a book he wants to write. So he's, he's in some ways manipulating the system to serve his own means. Yeah. But then, but then that, that becomes kind of later it starts starts to psychologically fuck with them right yes well yeah because he starts to he he starts to slide into inconsolable almost torture and drinking <laughs> you know it's like no wonder the guy ended up dying from complications of alcoholism because this destroyed him i mean like and i mean let's go ahead and say it right now he didn't write he didn't finish another book no, after this, not. this did not. broke him. <laughs> it did, it, and it it truly, like he says in the movie, that it it became the, it changed him, in every shape, in every in, in every way in his life, right? And and yeah, you have to kind of believe that it did. He never was the same after this. But yeah, so he's so he's using the system, manipulating the system to get more time with Perry. He's manipulating Perry to get Perry's story. Um, and then as these things, as things start to drag on, he, um, he needs to get the one key piece of information, which is the story of that night and what happened from Perry. Um, if he could have gotten it from Hickok, he would have taken it from him too, I'm sure. But Perry specifically was the one who I think his eloquence would have led him to believe it to be what happened well he i think you know he probably knows the story from hickok that basically oh, the, story, fair enough. The, yeah. the story from hickok was the confession that they used at the trial right <laughs> right right so um but he hasn't heard it from perry yeah. yeah so he doesn't know what's what's real he just knows hickok's version of things um and perry doesn't want to tell truman because he's afraid that if he tells Capote what really happened that he'll um 
don't not want to come around anymore is what I think. Right. Which is, and he wouldn't, wouldn't help him with any more lawyers. He wouldn't help him with the lawyers anymore. Right. So he's yeah. stringing them right. along as long, as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, ultimately like the, the pressure of that situation of what if I actually get these guys out? Right. I mean, he wouldn't get them out. They would get a, it would be a, a mistrial and they'd get another trial. Like they would be prosecuted again, but, the that wouldn't look good for, <laughs> for no. him, and it probably well, that, well good Chris for Cooper his novel, right? Yeah, to, I mean, to, yeah, Alvin Dewey, Chris Cooper, flat out tells him, "I will come to Manhattan and hunt you down." Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, right? Yeah, I mean, there, there, I, I don't not understand that perspective either, right? Because right. you're monkeying with a system mm -hmm. that is technically came to the proper conclusion even if the process in which they got to that conclusion was right or not yeah and it's Does that makes sense even, and I, I do and it's not even really that the death penalty is what's at stake here right right it's just it's just the the idea that this this will continue to go on and it'll continue to be in the public eye and it'll continue to be a black eye on the face of justice, right? Like it's more of a societable, a societable, the a societal. I, I want to put a B in there. Yeah, <laughs> a societal issue and a societal sc score, scorn, scar, scar. It just wouldn't look good for Truman. Yeah, and well, and also, it's going to continue to. Truman's always going to be around, talking about a terrible night for the small town. Yeah. You know, I mean, they just want evil to die tonight. <laughs> yeah, evil he dies also tonight. he also doesn't want to this to be in his life anymore. Right. right. Yeah. Like he wants to be done with it. He said, I've been working on this book. For, I've given this book four years of my life. Um, it's all I've done for four years. I just need it to be over. And well, I promise you breakfast at Tiffany's didn't take four years to write. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it could, which I, which I didn't realize that that's like a takedown of Tennessee Williams. I did not realize yeah. that. That's pretty funny. <laughs> they mentioned Tennessee Williams they too. Because, oh, he's uh, like, did Tennessee like, like my reading? My, my reading, yeah. Of course, <laughs> um, of course he did. <laughs> How fascinating in it, because we're kind of blowing through actually what happened, that Truman Capote's research assistant is fucking Harper Lee. <laughs> right. Who herself is right now midst, trying to buy it, trying to sell midst, her book. <laughs> she's in the midst of publishing one of the greatest books ever written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To mm -hmm. Kill a Mockingbird, which is sometimes assumed to have been written by Truman Capote, which is wild and hilarious. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't realize yeah, that. There, there's been there was some people think it. It's yeah. probably been that societable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> whispers. <laughs> I think he did. I think he did edit it. Because he did. Well, he a, talked about I'm reading. Sure. Mentioned like getting a copy sure. of it. I think yeah. he edited it. But some people say that there's no way this woman wrote this book. Truman Capote had to have written it. And which you I get don't a little. There, there's there are those subtle jabs throughout the movie that kind of at her. Some of that at her. Yeah. yeah. No, well, the man can get the name of her her book right. Right. You kill the bird. It's for or children. Or children. <laughs> yeah. It's, for it's, children. Almost, oh, it's a kid's book. It's almost like a little pat on the head. Good job, yeah. girl. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And that could be like men. You know. So societal standing at the time <laughs> <laughs> men are above women and the woman couldn't have written this but it's oh just, it's 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 just wild an element of that for sure uh, yeah. i mean the the yeah two of the two of the main characters in this movie are two of the greatest american authors of the of the yeah, last at least of the second of the half in, uh, right at least of the second yeah. half of the of the uh, century last century yeah um i mean two of the biggest best sellers of all time and it, Almost yeah. well. One is absolute required reading in school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all three of us probably read it and in fact, and, public and neither, school, and neither one of them finished a novel in their lifetime. Like that's yeah. that's crazy. Because right, supposedly, Go Set a Watchman was written prior to to kill. It was just not published. Right? Yeah, and it wasn't and it published. published. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but that's I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't even submitted. It wasn't even submitted for publication. It was just she just shelved it. I don't think she ever even considered it finished, right? Right. I think someone told her that, hey, why don't you tell this story like from 10, 20 years earlier? Why she thinks Atticus Finch is like 
this revered human and blah 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 and whatever is born all that's hearsay right that's just yeah what I, read. what I had heard too was that um the the original to kill a mockingbird was structured more like ghost at a watchman it would actually took place from from a viewpoint of like looking back right oh. and and that's i don't know who gave her the advice or if it's ever if it was even advice or if she just decided otherwise or if the story is even true i don't know but then but then she decided to kind of cut out all of that and just start it as if it was present in present day right yeah. and not do that flashback and but the flashbacks persisted like that version of that novel persisted and it became ghost of a watchman so gotcha yeah makes sense and but they look like if you assume, which I think a lot of people do, that that Scout is Harper Lee in some right. sense, mm-hmm. right? Because she right. was a tomboy, etc. Then her neighbor might have been in the book. Which it's Jem is her brother. Yeah, I can't remember what the neighbor kid's name is, but he might actually be Truman Capote. In oh, well, very well. And they Capote, lived next door to each other when they were kids. And Capote based um, a character in Other Voices, Other Rooms on her. Yes. So it, it would stand the reason that there would be cross, you know, cross inspiration. Uh, yeah. What was that? What was the name of that kid's name? Oh, I always say Jem, and then I realize it's the Jem brother. Jem is I, the brother. It was um, not Boo Radley. He was across the street. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dill. It was Dill. Yeah, Dill, Dill could be Truman Capote. Could I, uh, yeah, I never really thought, put that together, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah hmm. for sure. I like it. Me too. Um, I also... Oh, well, there it is. <laughs> so says Film Seizure. Um, so one thing I do like about this also is that, in a way, Truman Capote was playing a little bit of the Hunter S. Thompson uh kind of thing where he was going to write an article. He was originally hired to write an article Mm -hmm. and that was what he chose to write about. And then he realized, Oh no, this is far more of, this is far larger than what we thought. I'm going to turn it into a book. Um, So in a way it's a little bit of the, you know, the Hunter S Thompson way of things of, "Eh, I'll eventually get you an article. But in the meantime, I wrote, you know, 200 pages instead. So I'll just turn it into a book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is predating Hunter S. Thompson. Sure. So maybe Hunter S. Thompson was like, I'm going to do the Capote thing. <laughs> and you got to imagine, I mean, William Sean was the editor of the New Yorker. Yeah. Mr. Sean. Um, played by Bob Balaban in this. Wow, so many great character actors in this. Yes. Um, so you got to imagine like, when they re- when he realized what he had and it was going to be published as a novel and the new yorker had some rights to that right mm-hmm. because they were funding the trip they're funding the research so it's like man i must have been like a huge coup for him right well uh, so I think much so he, there's still a magazine today right <laughs> yeah. didn't he publish like a chapter or a part of the story in the new yorker for months i yeah, think it prob- was published as that, articles that could very well be yeah like, like his longer, longer articles. I don't, I'm not positive. Well, that. it could, it could have also been a situation where they used it like with the reading to get advanced, um, sales on it. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Um, you know, that's something you don't really have much anymore is the readings, right? Where you go to the auditorium, like he sold out an entire auditorium They happen to a read lot. I mean, it happened a lot once upon a time, but not so no, much. No, they happen anymore. a lot now in bookstores. They still happen. Well, a lot. in they're, bookstores, but they're, they're not yeah. as big as that was. Right? Yeah. They're not as big auditorium readings. Yes. Although, although when Steve oh, sure. yeah. decides to go out and do do public tours, he he gets large large crowds, and he reads. Oh yeah, even so. when him and Owen read for their. Mm-hmm. Their shared book, it was huge, audit- like college yeah. campus auditoriums yeah. and stuff like, like those that. Are, so those it's are, rare. Those are pretty big affairs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But in this, it kind of feels like, oh, it's just, t- you know, tonight it's it's Truman Capote. Tomorrow it might be Tennessee Williams or something, you know, that that's doing something. Could be. Uh, I think Truman Capote was pretty huge at this time. Oh, yeah. Too. I mean, yeah. especially, certainly after uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Breakfast at Tiffany's. 
because he in between writing his first book and breakfast at tiffany's he himself was writing films and he tells the story about writing the uh, john houston movie um which was um oh which one was that that was um uh, i can't remember Uh, for some reason i assumed he was talking about the film version of breakfast at tiffany's but i guess i just bogart Bogart wasn't in that um good beat the devil beat the devil that's the one beat the devil yeah um which is which is funny too because um (laughs) the treasure of sierra madre plays like a huge part in the in the, in, in cold, cold blood. blood yeah yeah <laughs> i was like god damn we're we just can't get away from john houston yeah yeah so that's a, that's a real interesting kind of snake eating its tail thing there yeah. right yeah. but uh but no i um so when when um when they do eventually uh arrest dick and perry um they take him to the to the holding cells, which in this small town they're just like in these apartments. There's just like the kitchen has a little jail in it. <laughs> yeah, but I was it, trying to figure that fucking thing out, and Truman makes a joke about it too. It's well, like, he says, you, "Yeah, it's like it, it's like an apartment because he even says sheriff's residence on the door." Yeah. And when he goes in, because it's and this is interesting because it's the kitchen he says they gave you the the women's cell yeah taking kind of some pity on perry and that's when perry asks for like aspirin because yeah he's got messed up leg um and that's their first kind of interaction and the whole time i almost kind of perceived it as a dig on him but but maybe not well you know it it, sometimes it is hard to to get exact because he says everything the same way and sometimes he means it you know on his surface what it is and sometimes he's a little bitch about it <laughs> you know right. that's the great thing about capote is that he's, he's sharp <laughs> it's a great thing about this performance because there's so much nuance i think that builds upon itself and in the performance i have to assume they shot chronologically but i don't know i don't know if they did or not um but by you know the first third of the movie obviously the, like the first thing you're trying to get over at least i am is like wow this is philip seymour hoffman doing a truman capote impersonation right <laughs> but it's a, it's a really good one but at some point i don't know when it happens but it completely melts away like it's gone like right. that 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 line that of between the two of them just disappears it, it gets hard to see it, it, it gets hard to see philip seymour hoffman yeah, it does, and you and That's you start to and you start so to really yeah, yeah. you really start to see the nuance of like the emotions of the decision making of when he lies, how little things change and how he delivers the lies to Perry, right? Mm-hmm. And how he like it's just like a it's effortless in a way, but not as effortless as you know he can be, right? Well, later on, there's a scene where he is talking to Harper Lee over the phone about something with perry to which he cracks a joke he doesn't say it any differently than anything else he would have normally said to her but it hits her so much differently mm-hmm. to and which she's like i don't i don't think this is funny anymore and he's like yeah. i never said it was right exactly yeah and, and 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 you start to wonder at that point it's like Oh my God, he's a master manipulator here at this that's point. Every, that's a really key scene too, because I think what he is reading to her are the journal, Perry's journals. Yes, when Perry has written what he would do if he were ever given a major award. Yep. yep. If he ever right. had to give a speech, yep. if he ever had to give a speech, what he would say, and it's very generic, but but very eloquently written, which comes into play at the end of the movie, which I find fascinating. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was like <laughs> purposely tied together. How much of that is just unreliable narrator on um, part of the filmmaker and on the part of Capote, but, but wow. Very cool. Um, and I'm going to lose my train of thought, but 
Oh, what I was going to say is it's narcissism, right? Like they're both two sides of a narcissism coin. Right. <laughs> one went out the there's front door, one went out the back door. Yeah, yeah, there's an admiration there. And yeah, it's exactly the two doors scenario. And I think that's what where it strikes Harper Lee weird is because she's starting to put that together. She's well, like, he told her and she didn't believe it, but now mm-hmm. she's starting to see mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. She's starting to see it. And she's starting to see her friend in a different way, you know, through the lens of his lens into this world. And it's all What's, there and super complicated and subtle and it just masterfully directed this movie right because yeah. for 75 percent of it she is his foil she's truman's foil mm-hmm. right like it's not perry perry's his buddy until yeah. a certain point right yeah. and all the time leading up to that it's harper who's like no or dude or you know like trying to rein him back in or putting him on the sidelines when people aren't receiving him well like oh like at the school when, when yes. he's just kind of staring and just kind of standing in the middle like of, you're making everyone fucking feel weird yeah it's sure, like I mean, I'll, i'm gonna handle this yeah. i'll go and handle it and then he, his response is just hmm. Hmm. yeah it's like that's he, he makes little noises like that for from time to time too where it's like but then he also kind of takes the reins back from her when they go to the girl's house that found the bodies and he makes that speech which again is kind of manipulating her totally. to talk to them totally. by saying people have always tried to conceive me or you know perceive me as a certain way it's truth though that's what's great it is about it, right? it is it's, it's truth in what he's saying but it's used in the exact appropriate time to get yep. what he wants yep. he is yep. he he just knows how to get what he wants from people yes right. it's it's why at every party scene he is surrounded by a half dozen people who want to hear his bullshit stories you know but they're well, so yeah. well told too i mean Even that's i know yeah i'm sorry to interrupt but that's no no go ahead that story he tells about the other author i don't even want to repeat the words he says about the black guy the jew God, and, yeah and all that stuff it's like okay well harper is writing a book right now or getting a book published right now about a black guy who supposedly raped a girl and is mm-hmm. going to, and he's like he's kind of digging at her i think a little bit too and i'm like that's his best friend yeah like <laughs> Like, if that's well, his best friend, you cannot trust this man for anything. Right. Like, well, later, you know, he's at the other party, and um, Bruce Greenwood, his, 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 who's playing his partner, is, is like, Another you know, this is the start. Character. Yeah. This is the start of a, of, another, of a fantastic love affair. And she's like, yeah, Truman with Truman. You know, it's uh, like yeah. he's just in love with himself as he's, like, just telling this – kind of grotesque story about what he saw when he was in kansas and and his whole fascination of them of what he the story he tells is that they had to have put the pillow underneath the one kid's head to shoot him in the head i don't think that just i just don't think that's what is what it is but he is kind of romanticizing that concept well, he either sees it. I wonder about that, too, because even the whole thing about why would they tuck Nancy in, either he's perceiving things beyond what normal people would. Like, she wasn't tucked in when they shot her. They tucked her in after or whatever the things that he says. It's like, I think it's giving credit to his perception more than him being a weirdo because he does kind of come off as a weirdo too when he says those things like they didn't put the pillow under his head truman come on yeah maybe he's perceptive well in 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 cold blood they just shoot the kid when he's laying down and they uh perry covers the girl when hickok attempts to rape her right so that is now whether or not that's capote dramatizing this concept or the movie dramatizing a detail um but there is nothing more to that in that adaptation so yeah which i i was looking for that because i was like when it happened i was like oh yeah kids just lying is laying on his pillow anyway of course you know or whatever but yeah yeah, he, he is almost romanticizing these two killers in a way but you're right, Chuck. He may also be on to something 
And sometimes it's hard to tell which Capote you're looking at in this movie. Right. Well, right. he's all, yeah, you, you never know exactly what he, you always know who he needs something from, but you don't yeah. always know exactly how he's manipulating that person, but he always is. He always yeah. is. Oh, it's his story about beat the devil that wins over um, the wife of the sheriff. Oh, which yeah, then gets the him Amy Ryan. Yeah, Amy Ryan before before the <laughs> office. Yeah, uh, she was good in that too, man. Uh, yeah. But the um, but yeah, and like that wins her over, which wins over her husband, which then says, "Come here, I want to show you something," and lets him see the pictures from the crime scene. Um, which he had already, when Harper Lee kind of took over the, I will set up all the conversations with people so you don't have to be a weirdo about it. Um, he went and snuck into the, to the, um, uh, to the funeral home and looked at the, at the mom's body and saw that it, the, that the head was put back together by gauze, Mm -hmm. which yeah. I think right there changed his yeah. trajectory on it. Cause it was at that point, he's like, this isn't an article. This is a book. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, he sees some things. <laughs> he does. He does. And there, and we're, while we're talking about the manipulation, we're talking about the relationship between, you know, Perry and, and Truman, which is really kind of at the heart of this movie. Yes. Is what is that? You know, the question is raised. It does seem like at times, again, it's, it's probably just his manipulation, but how much of it is real? Like how much is Truman falling in love with Perry? Yeah. How much is, of it is manipulation? How much is his falling in love? And he even goes as much to say the quiet part out loud to Harper and say that Jack Dunphy, his his partner, you know, th- thinks, you know, it's it's one or the other or both. And he's like, I don't know how it could be both, is, is, was his Truman's reaction to that. But it's like it kind of is. You can kind of see, at least in the performance, the there is almost like a romantic affection that is that is kind of emanating, I guess. But I also feel like it partially they're just so in tune to what the other one needs that maybe they're just giving that but not really receiving it. Well, there is sense. certainly, yes, absolutely. Cause th- there is a tenderness between them. Yeah. You know, and, but, at, but also you're right in the sense that in some ways Capote wants to use these people to sell a book in other ways, Perry is using Capote to say, Hey, I really am smarter than what most people think I am. Look, I wrote stuff, you know, um, Oh, and by the way, Hickok's uh, own journal was nearly turned into a book too, but declined because they went to the same publisher as In Cold Blood, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Yeah, Capote's already beaten you to it. We're we're waiting for his manuscript." Yeah, um, and that whole that whole thing of of them, the give and take. It's almost like they're flirting, right? Yeah, yeah. For yeah. that for that one end goal. Which yeah. you know what, what flirting is trying to get to normally. Here is the mm. truth, right? The truth of yep. the night right. of November fifteenth, nineteen fifty nine. Truth, truth, and they and keep truth flirting. And freedom is what it really is, yeah. right? Yeah, mm. and they're both flirting back and forth, but neither of them willing to get into bed. Right. Really. Yep. No, one, no one wants right? to consummate like, the deal. With, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's because what it feels like because, the whole entire movie. Totally. It's yeah, a because it's a te- it's a tension and it's a sexual tension at least at least partially, right? Right. Well, yeah, yeah right. I mean it, take that take that analogy one step further, Chuck. Sometimes you get you know you don't want to get in the bed with somebody because you don't know how they're going to feel about you after you're done. Hmm. So what's yeah, sure. Perry what's Perry going to think Capote thinks of him after they consummate this, you know, getting to the truth. And Capote right. refuses to tell him the name of the book, right? Yep. Right. Um, because the, the name of the book is something that can crumble this whole relationship. Yeah. yeah. Both of their, both of their truths are the end of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if Truman Capote tells him, I called my book in cold blood, then Perry needs to know, knows all he needs to know about what Truman thinks about him and what he did. Right. Yep. And then if Truman or Perry tells Truman the truth, same. 
right? Yep, yep. Like they're, they're in the, the same and, predicament. And, and we both said things yet. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. And both things in cold blood and the truth confirms the other. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. We yeah. haven't said his name yet. I don't think, but Clifton Collins Jr. Yeah. Is also phenomenal in this. Um, is there a bad performance in this movie? There really is. There not. isn't, unless unless you count that freaking the kid? cowboy kid in the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I don't know what the hell that's supposed to be. It's that is Mike, just, the mouth of the south. Well, it's, uh, it's well, Mike, no. Mike TV cross with yeah. Ross Garcia. Yeah. And what I took it as, <laughs> what I took it as was that you know the kid is is like pulling out a gun. And he's like pew pew, and it, it's kind of like. Yeah, anybody could be a killer at any point in time. Yeah. That, you know. And that's what it's I mean. It's, it's just it's a way on the nose. Yeah, it just sure, doesn't but, be there. For a movie that is playing in such subtlety, and it's just it gets so out of left field. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like a reminder of what's at stake that's not really needed. Yeah. 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 So I agree with that. But yes, um, Clifton Collins is is wonderful in this. His admi- admission scene is like insanely oh. good. I mean, oh, it's up guy. there with Robert Blake's scene in in Cold Blood, where the rain looks like he's crying as he's giving his big final, you know, uh, monologue. Uh, it's, I mean, it, it's the character of Perry. I think that that is the uh, that can be really, really good. Yeah. Chris Cl- Clifton Collins, man, just one of those great working character actors. He has got, you know, 100 credits across film and television. No no role is too small. It seems, you know, he's just it's just impressive. Well, he's and he's like that one guy that you always think you've seen before. You know, yeah. like he's the most, he's oh, like yeah. super recognizable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, probably because well, you've seen him a hundred times. <laughs> right. <Dude>. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's like uh, going through the, the movies on his list. It's like, oh, the replacement killers. I've seen that. Yeah. Um, and then you're just like, keep going. That rules of attraction. I've seen that. He's the uh, police and Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. <laughs> with, uh, <clears throat> with Thomas Jane. Mm hmm. The I guy the, who's supposed to get all of the attention, but yeah, it's it's that guy where it's like, I know that guy. <laughs> I think the first thing I remember him from, like, probably not the first thing I saw, but the first thing I remember him from was 187. Remember that movie? With, oh, yeah. With Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. I do remember that. Um, was, oh, my God. Like he's a, He was like a Mexican uh, gang member that like, him and Sam Jackson are kind of like – cat and mousing yeah it's, it's, yeah it's a crazy movie um he was also nero's first officer in jj abrams star trek oh, oh. <laughs> so right there with the yeah the whole time with the uh, freaking um, eric banna hmm. classic yeah. anyway i just anyway wanna, he, i want to make sure we mention his name because i've always admired him yeah and you've got mark pellegrino as um as hickok too um yeah, yeah. tons of stuff there tons too stuff. yeah kind of a similar career right just like just like awesome amazing working actor a lot of genre stuff i think for mark was Mellon. he one of the carpet guys in the big lebowski or who was oh my god the... yeah he was he was one he was of the he carpet guy of, he was one of the the thugs yeah yeah the carpet pisser yeah he wasn't yeah. the carpet <laughs> pisser, but he was the other he guy. was the other one yeah 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 <laughs> Totally. That's yep. that's funny that that's his biggest movie, according to you know. Oh really? That's that is weird. Yeah. I mean, well, I he's the uh, Mulholland Drive. I mean, he's in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's in that. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, again, this movie is just. He's also heck, done a lot of television. A lot yeah. of television. Yes. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it's just this movie is so packed with people that you recognize or you know from other. Thing. I mean, like going all, I mean, even to like Amy Ryan and, and then Bob Balaban, who actually has a bigger part in the second half of the movie. Mm-hmm. Or Aaron uh, Lockhart shows up and you're like, I know that woman. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Um, police Academy. Yeah. Police Academy lady. Um, mm-hmm. She was in other things I know her for. I'm like, I totally know that face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Oh yeah. She was the wife of the commandant wasn't she yeah huh. she's in this yeah but yeah so i mean it's just like 
uh, whatever whatever voodoo that this movie had like it was perfectly put together because i mean the way the i mean the cinematography is great it you know you you really do get like you feel like you're in the small ass town in kansas the whole time you get this impression that you really are in the middle of nowhere also so it really kind of heightens the the crime and the sense that these big city this big city guy is kind of i don't want to say messing with them but but kind of messing with them you know in well, the in the sense that he's always around if if they didn't already feel like their innocence had been taken because of the murders themselves now they've they have the quote unquote you know vultures descending as well yeah right and and it's become a, it's become a circus and yeah i think that part of it is yes these events changed capote's life but these events changed that town forever mm -hmm. you right know, the psyche of that town too and it and then of course you know he uses that town as a as a portrait of america of just of rural america and of 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 you know in some ways the death of the american dream right mm -hmm. this 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 whatever this is that has infected society you're not no one's immune from it right it, all the like the imagery he paints with all the lights being on the houses and the people being up what are they afraid of this could happen again and you're like mm -hmm. my god mm -hmm. but that's yeah. like the beginning of the movie and we've been talking about performance and all that sort just the shooting of the desolate grays and empty spaces with almost like perfectly lined trees and perfectly lined houses whenever they show it it's like it i don't even know what the emotion is it gave me but i was i just felt lonely going mm -hmm. into this movie like i'm alone on the whatever this ride is i'm the only one taking it right now <laughs> well, I mean, you and I both watched it by ourselves. Uh, Jason, did you watch it by yourself? Yeah, too? I did. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we all I think, we, I we think all approach the movie that looks like loneliness alone, and certainly Perry is using Capote to not be alone in his last few days. Because mm -hmm. uh, I feel like he knows, like even when he's kind of hopeful, you kind of get the impression he knows this can only go so far until because they did it i mean they, right. they're guilty they're guilty everyone knows they're guilty yeah ricardo has said as much multiple times even in the middle of the movie when you might feel some doubt about whether they did it he ricardo's saying we never meant to kill those people it was not premeditated right right well yeah and at one point he's like perry's not eaten to to help out the case that he's insane right <laughs> right which to which again that's perry manipulating people mm-hmm and and, and it works right. uh, exceptionally well on on Capote. It's funny uh, watching like maybe the f little more than the first third of this movie. Um, I wasn't I wasn't sure. I was recollecting in Cold Blood and the events of the murders correctly, and I was like, I started conflating it with like a Thin Blue Line. I was like, oh, is this like a Thin Blue Line situation where Capote? like solves the murders the actual murders and these guys get off and i was like no of course that's not what this is but there was a <laughs> moment hilarious. there was a moment where i felt like that's the way the movie if you weren't familiar was trying to manipulate you right and i don't know if that was a conscious choice or if that was just because of all of the the true crime the true crime um film making and, a murder and, right, you watch come since and I all mean, that stuff I mean, yeah. certainly in true, or, uh, the Thin Blue Line, Errol Morse's Thin Blue Line, he probably started out trying to do his Truman Capote impersonation, mm -hmm. right? And it just became what it became, and it, and it became, again, like a landmark game changer for how documentaries were viewed, right? So I just find that right. that comparison fascinating as well. But yeah, that, but I was, I was thinking, oh, is this like a – did he do a Thin Blue Line before – Aaron Morris was like, no, he did, but he didn't. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I now, was thankfully able to put my recollection of what actually happened at the door when I watched this movie, so I could feel those things. Like my memory helps me when yeah. I'm watching movies like this because <laughs> I can I can forget that they were guilty when I first start watching. Yeah, it, I definitely know, but... didn't remember. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I. <laughs> so it was it was nice. It was, it was yeah. You're right. We can you can be perce- you can perceive those in a, a more acute way. Right. right, because you are kind of being puppet brought along through the story. Yeah, you're being manipulated too. Exactly just like, right. Exactly yeah. right. Yep. I want to pitch a show to CBS where Truman Capote and Errol Morris goes town to town solving mysteries, <laughs> like just being a couple of like weirdos, like you know, like the complete outsiders sort of thing. You know, yes. Yeah. And they yeah. go and they solve mysteries. And, I mean, that's so weird, but I would watch it. I would. Totally they need. They it. need to have Harper Lee with them to actually. Oh, oh God, she. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she would. She would be like their the the guest that they have to like. She would probably solve it. In she's the, Vilma. Every episode. Yeah. She's. Yes. Exactly. She's. Well, no. Vilma she would. She would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so perfect. <laughs> 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 oh my god anyway cbs call me up i got an I mean, idea yeah we gotta start developing that put, put that right you know put that on the same night as elsbeth and you can have weirdo night you know oh or whatever <laughs> weirdo crime solver night <laughs> <laughs> um no the um uh, when so the actual like let, let's actually like get to the the, the truth right yeah mm-hmm. so and this is and, and you know this is basically there is some contest to exactly who did what right but i personally believe that what we see in this is the truth in the sense that uh, um perry did commit all four murders yeah I, so in this that's the way it's portrayed in the second movie or in the in the movie it looks like uh, hickok might have slit someone's throat i don't know well the, if, if, uh, the way it's edited or shot it it, it well it's perry's a little bit boot. more it's Perry's boot that that is next to the is his boot print that's next to the father, and he was the one who he obviously has uh, parent uh, parental issues, and that is much more played out in uh, in Cold, Cold Blood. Blood. Yeah, and it seems I thought he was the one who jumped on yeah. top of the father, kind of started beating him up, and then slit his throat. Yeah, and then left the boot print on the bed next to him. Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, was, yeah, yeah. Because well, that's it was, another thing. Not not to interrupt. No, go ahead. What happened in, in Cold Blood? What I think this movie does so well by Truman drawing the comparison to himself and and Perry Smith when he describes his mother leaving him in a hotel and him screaming his eyes out. Mm-hmm. until he passes out that's perry smith too mm-hmm. yeah yep. right because he's already said we're the same kid so you get that sense that perry's been treated terribly by his parents even if we're not told yeah in, in cold you blood they I mean? they do a lot of flashback stuff in in cold blood where mm-hmm. um he uh, he adores his mother and he watches his father beat her like a lot that's a that's an incredible scene yeah in cold blood when they're in mexico and um hickok gets a um a dick hickok gets um this is fun to say uh <laughs> that's why I he, gets a, he gets a prostitute. Like fun. he gets a prostitute he gets a prostitute he's having sex with the prostitute while um while perry is kind of just having a nervous breakdown in the other room and he's having that flashback of his mother um who was caught having an affair because she well not really having an affair because she had left right she had left with the kids and and his dad found them and he caught her making love with another man and he roughed her up pretty bad it's the same actress who's playing both the mom and the prostitute right yeah well they're very close at the very least yeah 
But he then that yeah. he sees a lot of people that, like as his father or as his mother and in cold blood, yeah. and it really hammers home the the nature and nurture kind of aspect of this, right? Well, and, and and he's also like, I mean, he's he's a he's a person made out of entirely TNT that's about to explode, mm-hmm. um, which kind of is. It's sort of how it's portrayed to the point where he just kind of takes it upon himself in this movie. It's like, look, we're just going to start. He slices the, the father's throat and it all just happens. The way he tells quick. that story is like, I saw him as a gentle man <sighs> yeah. all the way up until I slit his throat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, yep. oh, shit. That's chilling. Like, that's it's chilling. Yeah. It is. It's that's very something chilling. that is very difficult to understand. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what makes probably is what makes this so interesting and was made it such a bombshell when it came out is that type of detail to hear that and really how do you reconcile that? Yeah, because you're right. Well, it, 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 you it see it, it on anyone. It could be you, anyone. You right see now. it on Capote's face mm-hmm. when he said he, he like his heart sinks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh God, the, yeah. he is a monster. Mm-hmm. It's something he's always known. But yeah, but yeah, he he's not confronted with it, you know, yeah. quite that way until then. Um, yeah, so he he does that, and then he starts going through the house with. He takes the shotgun from Hickok, and he starts going room to room. Um, yeah. And it's quick, is the impression that you get that it goes from zero to 60 in just a once few seconds. Made, once he's made the decision to kill one, they're all dead. He, he's got to kill, no, no witnesses is right. the big thing. Yeah. Um, and they, they say that it's both in, in Capote and in, in cold blood where they talk about no witnesses. Mm-hmm. It almost gives you the impression there was premeditation, even sure. if they don't want to believe that they were going to do that. They were just going to take the money and go. But if they it's call, if they talk about no, no witnesses, that leads me to believe they were planning on killing them from the beginning. Well, if it's in cold blood and it's based on the book, then that, that is where I would draw the source of truth, right? The fact that it's right in this movie just corroborates yeah. that it's trying to be factual, right? At least to the, the source material. Sure. Sure. But you also in the, at least in the, in Capote, you get the sense that um, Perry was never really going to go along with that. And he also didn't really believe that Hickok could kill anyone, right? Um, but it, but yes, but but Perry just had that moment of like just absolutely. It's a little Hollywooded up, I think, in this movie a little bit. Could very and, well be, unless Truman truly believed that this, or however he, I haven't read in Cold Blood. We've only seen you guys watching the source material, and then this, right? Like, I don't know what the description Truman had of Perry before hearing this mm-hmm. thing, right? Mm-hmm. It could be very well known that he was capable of this. Well, right? that's the but interesting thing. In the movie, well, he, has, well, he, like, has, killed, oh he has killed before. That's the thing, too. Because the sister, the sister kind of co- corroborates the idea mm-hmm. that he could be a murderer. Right. That he will be nice to you until he isn't. I mean, right. yeah, I mean, I mean, he literally had killed before. I guess he would, I think it was a manslaughter charge or something. Something like that. Right? Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, so so I guess, you know, I've said it a couple of times where the, the story is kind of contested who did what. And um, some, and now Hickok has always, I mean, always stuck with the original Perry killed all four of them. Right. There are some stories that said, well, Hickok was at least in the rooms with him holding the flashlight to the victims so that Perry could see them to shoot them. There are other stories where um, Hickok till, killed two of the people, like the two women, <laughs> I think, and that Perry killed the two guys, the the father and the son. I think that's I could I could have that mixed up, but um but that Perry only took the credit for all four because he says he felt bad for Hickok's mom who would have to live with this if she were to find out her son was a murderer. That one I think has been mostly dispelled. Mm. Um, 
because it's kind of a silly thing to say mm -hmm. right it doesn't it's, even matter though because they both died right like whether for whatever reason they did what like it would make a difference in reality if sure. hickok didn't get the get hung as well and i think probably why they both got the both got hung is that there's no way hanged. to prove who did it. Hung, hanged thank you hanged. they yeah. were hanged they both yes. got hanged hanged that's a weird word. they got harangued by a hanging <laughs> but yeah it, i mean it doesn't matter who took yeah i mean it, i think the only thing that it that it does speak to is the nature of the beast right which i think capote was trying to get to as far as why would these people be like this and and sometimes the beast is eloquent and is you know and can speak in flowery language and seem sensitive but in but as his sister says it could be a monster inside you know it's way more effective for truman's walls to fall down over perry having done all four murders and exactly to him way more effective for the film forget what really happened right this movie, oh yeah it works great <laughs> yeah oh absolutely and i think that's why i tend to believe that he killed all four because i don't know i mean there is a sensationalism to it right that you know and and yeah we're gonna be you know we can be manipulated by that as well um but anyway no it's um uh, the the supposedly the last words that each one of them said before they were hanged were kind of interesting in the sense that um i think uh what well, hickok says something about being sorry he apologizes to the people um to the investigators and to the victims um and perry says that he thinks capital punishment is illegal and wrong <laughs> or and morally wrong um again being kind of the person who is more kind of interesting in that but sense. in the movie to you know the juxtaposition and no, i'm not even going to say juxtaposition <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to bring you i'm going to bring i'm, like, I'm, I'm going to bring you a uh, of this, you know, this episode i'm um, i'm going to bring you a, a dictionary to your cell so you can <laughs> but, but as jason mentioned earlier he wrote the speech yes what he would say if he had ever been asked to give a give a speech and here he's asked to say final words which could be construed as you know give your speech and he's like is there any members of the family here and they're like no and he's like i can't i can't remember what i was gonna say yeah, yeah. basically yeah and and it's different in the in in cold blood the movie it's different he he says i feel like i should apologize or something like that but i don't know to whom yeah right because yeah. Who does he well, I think, and and yeah, I mean, and to that, it's like uh, that. That even says something too, right? Mm -hmm. Like where it's like, oh, maybe he's not quite that remorseful, right? You know, and he um, asks. He does ask. Is any any of members of the family yeah. there? Yeah. Then at that point, yeah, it's like he can only apologize to the people he killed. Right. He doesn't even think about the people who survived. Yeah. Which there are two. They didn't mention in, like in the courtroom during the trial. He's just like fixating on doodling and and drawing yeah. things. He's like he so does say did from even the process of of what's happening. Yeah, yeah Capote, Capote, you know, nudges Harper Lee and says, "Look, he's not even here." Yeah, or it's like he's not even here, or something like that. Yeah, he's like someplace else. Um, yeah, he's. Uh, very um a, a very uh well-rounded character yeah as far as how he's always being kind of portrayed um yeah it really is i mean it's 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 a good performance it's a it's a fascinating character and you can tell again you don't know like is it the chicken or the horse 
chicken or the horse, Jesus Christ, chicken or the egg. <laughs> the, the look on I Chuck's wish face, I wasn't on mute there. The look oh. on Chuck's face <laughs> was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> 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 It was like the look of what? <laughs> the, yes, I'm not laughing at what you said. I'm laughing at Chuck's face. <laughs> it was so good. Oh, uh, but yeah, is it a chicken? Chicken or the egg? I don't even know what I was gonna say. What came first, the um, the parry or the or the capote? You know, which right? Which, 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 which who thing created fascinated? Whom? Who created who? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where what, some of it you understand was a fascination. But then how much of that fascination was justified after the fact, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is <laughs> Chuck. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck is so broken. It he looks like I Beaker. Can't. He looks I like can't. Beaker from the Muppets. He's yes, like he does. Mouth down. <laughs> I can't. I can't. The chicken or the fucking chicken horse, horse, man. <laughs> we should rename chicken. our podcast Chicken or Horse. The chicken or the horse. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken or the horse conundrum. You never heard of that? It's an age old, age old paradox. Um, the chicken uh, or horse. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. I mean, I can understand being confused over that at the restaurant, but I mean, I don't know about. At a anyway. restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What, what, because, what restaurants are you going to that serves a horse? Don't name the that's country. What, don't name the country, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say that's what that's what makes it confusing. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, the chicken or the horse? <laughs> oh my god. Oh. Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. This is a movie that. Um, I mean, we, we. This is what our third or fourth time we've seen. Um, Hoffman in a movie. Uh, we had almost we famous Magnolia. Magnolia, Magnolia, Lebowski, Capote. Almost famous. Do we do that one? Yeah, I, I yeah. mentioned that one. Oh, geez. Um, so, but still, um, this is, I mean, uh, the whole time watching this, like I said, it was hard to see Philip Seymour Hoffman beyond him. I mean, like, that's uh, Truman Capote. I'm watching. I'm I'm thinking of him as Truman Capote, but it, through that, I also was like, "That's a goddamn shame that Philip Seymour Hoffman died." Yeah, it really I thought is. that several times watching it. Yeah, um, because who knows? I mean, what that was almost 20 years ago when he was in Capote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. That was he was nominated for three more Oscars before he died. Mm-hmm. He was our greatest living actor at the time, right? Or close to? I mean, uh, up there. I mean, for for a solid Daniel Day Lewis, Philip Seymour Hoffman, like who else? Who else? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. You don't have to answer that. Really. Uh, yeah, I, like I, I can't think of anybody as far as like male actors. I mean, no. I mean, yes, like yes, man. that's the that's the thing. It's like. For a solid fifteen years, he was. I mean, he came the first time you saw him. You almost think, man, that guy's going to be and like. He is always more who he's playing than what he's he than what the, you than what you think he is. He was the best part of Boogie Nights, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he had a small role Scotty in that movie, right? Like, yep. I don't yeah. know. I, I I'm partial to. John C. Riley. John C. Riley's the other God, for sure. He's also the other in Magnolia, or one of the others in Magnolia that you're like, <laughs> right. I really like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Anyway. Anyhow, uh, I mean ordering porno mags on the phone. That's that's great. Good <laughs> stuff. Uh, yeah. The um Yeah. Uh Oh, this is this is good. Just talking about in cold blood, as far as uh, something that Tom Wolf wrote about it. The book is neither a who done it nor a will they be caught, since the answers to both questions are known from the outset. Instead, the book's suspense is based largely on a totally new idea in detective stories: the promise of gory <laughs> details and the withholding of them until the end. And that's kind of exactly how the book and this movie mm-hmm. and well, that movie will also, I mean, that's exactly how that plays out. The, yeah. You, you get flashes, but the truth 
is worse than you thought it was going to be. And I think that's why some people wonder if Philip Seymour Hoffman reconstructed this to make it land that way. Like the way he tells the story might be a little bit fiction and not nonfiction. Truman Capote, you mean. What did I say? Philip Seymour Hoffman. I was well, getting a little confused. It is true. I was like, is this yeah, the I mean, or the horse? Yeah, yeah you're yeah. putting the chicken before <laughs> the horse. <laughs> chicken or horse. Yes, yeah, some people do question the validity sure. of the narrative here because it lands so perfectly. Like, all those gory details do come at the end. It's kind of like the staircase, <sighs> almost. I don't know how to say it, but that that whole... Um, documentary is like build up, build up, build up, and then you get a bombshell. The same with the Jinx with yeah. Yeah. Robert Blake. Is it Robert Blake? Do I have the right person? No, no, Robert Durst. But that Robert is Durst. Thank you. That you said Robert Blake because he was Perry in in, in True Blood. Yeah, and I think he was you, one of you said the name. He was eventually convicted of murder. Yeah. No, he was not. Oh, he, he was, was acquitted. He was, he was acquitted? acquitted of murder. Uh, he, was, he was. He was. He um, was. Oh, he was arrested him. for murder. I'm thinking but, of Phil Spector. Yes. He was, he was a, uh, you were going to say Ronnie, Ronnie, uh, what's her name? Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Blake. Ronnie Blaze, oh. yeah. Yeah. No, the, yeah, um, but yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. So Robert Blake was, was indeed arrested for his wife's murder, but there was just enough circumstantial evidence for the jury to say, no. Um, although some people thought, I think the <sighs> prosecutor said that one Blake is a pretty bad person and two, the, the jury were idiots for falling for the, I defense. think people still think he's a killer for that. Oh, man. sure. I mean, the, the circumstantial evidence uh, is weird and he could have been complicit in the crime, even if he didn't pull the trigger. Um, he might, cause I think some people think he hired his bodyguard to kill her. <laughs> yeah. There's yeah, I remember Bonnie so, Baker, right? Bakley. Yep. Yeah. Blakely. Yeah. Bakley. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, but no, um, it's, uh, yeah, this is, um, this is a good movie, man. I mean, it's, it it's one of those things where you almost just say you gotta see it for yourself to really see how impactful a performance in a sea of really solid performances is. Yeah. It, I mean, even if you know the story, this is a worthwhile telling yep. for sure. Um, Cause I would watch it again tomorrow, probably to see things I missed in, sure. in the knowing, right? Like yeah. now I know for sure, but, well, it made me want to want to pop in the, the criterion disc of in cold blood and the whole time I'm sitting there watching, it's like, yep, 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 yep. I see all of this from, you know, like it all so perfectly meshes together. You know, it's so interesting. You know, you know what I would do to make this movie better? It's a joke. So I'll preface it with that. But oh, the, oh. Cow, the, the cowboy kid scene, if you remove him and you cut in Robert Blake as the mystery man from Lost Highway. And it's like, you have a telephone call, sir. And you just cut it the same way. But with, with, but with Robert Blake as the mystery man, that is masterpiece right there. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to go. There's so many the, layers to that that I love it so much. <laughs> I, thought you were, I thought you were going to go with the bubble gum you like is coming back in style. Oh, no, no, no. It's got to be Robert Blake. It's got to okay. be Robert Blake to tie mm -hmm. in. Yes. In cool yes. Blood. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe, may, I mean, it's just a shame then that Lynch didn't make this movie then, right? I mean, I think that there, there should be a cut of it. I'm going to maybe try to attempt that. <laughs> okay, you do that. <laughs> you do that. Um, yeah, yeah but. On the YouTubes. <laughs> so here's, here's the question. The million dollar question. We have five Best Picture nominees. We have The Graduate. <clears throat> we have Barry Lyndon. We have Pritzi's Honor. We have Babe, and we have Capote. What are you voting for? You are the member of the Academy. You are, you are a three-person member of the mm -hmm. Academy. What am I voting for for best picture? Yes. 
I still got to go Barry Lyndon, personally. I would, I would too. But it's, it is a lot closer to my second place, this film, Capote, than I would have thought. I'm so keen to recency bias that I don't want to have that. I wish I watched them like a month ago so I could say this, because I really, like, Capote is fucking wonderful. But Barry Lyndon is one of the most beautiful films, like, yeah. just to watch yeah. I've ever seen. And I was enthralled in that story as weirdly slow as it was it felt right so i would give it to bear i'm guessing you would go capote chap um this is kind of this is tougher for me still to this day babe well i mean still to this day i think the graduate is one of the best made films um, maybe not as beautiful as Barry Lyndon. I mean, Barry Lyndon gets the cinematography award for me if I vote in that category too. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a construction to The Graduate that is undeniable for me. Babe is the movie of these five that I would watch anytime anybody wants to put it in. Uh, yeah, let's watch it. Um, but the subject matter of Capote is one of my favorite, like, concepts of Truman, specifically Truman Capote going to Kansas and doing all of this stuff. So, yeah, I'm going to vote for Capote. Hmm. Um, and and the, 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 I mean, and Hoffman's, per, I mean, well, Philip Seymour Hoffman's performance <laughs> is, I mean, again, it's the, I think it's the best performance period of anything this month. I would agree that this movie is a better acted movie than Barry Lyndon. But, um, <clears throat> but for what, for, yeah, like just purely from a, like a technical and a directorial style. And um, I've still got to go. I got to go Barry. I got to. Um, now I would break it's my own. Definitely a movie. I would. I would. I would probably. I'll revisit that again before I revisit this. But I would revisit this. Capone. Yeah. It's I mean, I like would on still the, on the on the visitation list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Don't Here's forget the, to put. Don't the forget. Money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh my god. That. <laughs> that whole scene with the warden. Uh, we didn't even talk about the warden. Yeah, it, it, he get, he's like, I need to see them whenever, however, for as long as I want. And they're like, well, that's not really how we do things. And he slides over the money. I he's wouldn't like, want the state to have to bear this expense. Mm-hmm. It's like, use this it how is, you see fit. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says, what does it, what is it that the warden says? It's like some gruesome shit. And uh, to which Capote's like, you're a very kind man. <laughs> Oh, he says he says he's fifty percent Indian, fifty percent white. I did your friend a favor and put him and with I the marked white. him as white. Yeah, and oh, you're a very oh, kind yeah. man. And it's like that is the, the, there's a gruesome. It's a little in, bit throwaway, but also like oh yeah, of course, like it implies things. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's a Marshall dis- Bell, by the way, another great character actor. Yeah, you might remember him from the as the um, gym coach in Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two. Oh yeah, he turns out to be a leather daddy. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, he he does want to hang out with Capone. Isn't then. everyone a leather daddy in Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two? <laughs> kind of. The yeah, only person who isn't is the girl. <laughs> yeah. Great movie, Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. Oh yeah, I really enjoy that. Hell yeah, Marshall but, um, still alive, still acting. Well, he was how did something. Amy Ryan? Never mind. I don't. I don't want to belabor this. Amy Ryan, <laughs> what? Well, she played like an older woman in this, and she was so young. She wasn't that old. How old was she when she made this? Probably. What well, was this? Was twenty years ago now, right? Like thirty-seven. Amy Ryan. Well, she would have been. And she was the the. She would have been thirty-six. And the chiefs. She was the chief's wife. He was in his fifties. Maybe. Well, I mean, that's also not that uncommon. I guess. Yeah. Mind. I mean, their kids are not that old. I'm like, more marveling at like mid 2005 movie actresses and actors seem like they haven't aged in 20 years. Like even Catherine mm-hmm. Keener, when I see her now, I'm like, yeah. has she aged? Yeah, right. Yeah. Is more the <laughs> thing, not necessarily the the opposite, but right. 
I mean, Chris Cooper, yeah, is 17 years older than Amy Ryan. So there you go. Just just in the actors, they were. That's what I was talking <clears throat> about. She looked much younger than him, and she was. But she still <laughs> looks very young. And she was. <laughs> she still looks very young, Amy Ryan. All right. Pretty early role for her, too. Yeah. Well, she got a good one. She got a good one. Um, yeah, so um, I think we did it. We did it. Yeah. We we did it. Those also rans are are winners in our hearts. Well, for the yes, most sir. part, yes, for, for the most part. <laughs> I mean, I'm just glad that I bounced back after disappointing you with the. Uh, you didn't have to ask me when the when the last time I watched this movie. <laughs> that was it doesn't 80? fucking matter. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> And I think that was an appropriate question for last week, but yeah. Well, that was two weeks ago. Maybe, two, but, whenever it was. Yeah. I don't. Well, you didn't have to ask it for Babe, and you didn't have to ask it for Capote. I feel vindicated now. Right. So. <laughs> That'll do, Jeff. That'll do. Yay! Oh, here comes the waterworks. Um, anyway. All right. So, uh, yeah. I, Capote, just watch it. That's that's uh, like we were saying. Just watch it. That's the best. That's the best way to really see all the nuance in yeah, this movie. Yeah, no discussion. Can, discussion can really do it justice. Just discussion. Uh, how you doing, Popeye? Popeye? That's what I get for <laughs> trying to talk with a pen in my mouth. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You really got to see the performances to really understand why this movie is so so good. Yes, yes. Um, agree. Yeah, and a movie that should twenty years on still be talked about how about how good it is. Yeah, that sadly yeah. kind of isn't. Um, yeah. But anyway. it'll get reappraised. I feel it. <laughs> Hopefully not in the negative. Um, anyway, so yeah, we close out this month. We had we had off world next month. Everything mm -hmm. film seizure is off world this year. This this month of uh, August. This upcoming month of August, starting tomorrow, is August, and uh, we. Uh, we we kind of taken things a little interesting here with these sci-fi picks um, because the way we're going to end this month is a new way of doing one of our discussion episodes. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, but we kick things off on August 7th with the movie Sunshine with uh, Killian Murphy, I believe, right? Yes. Um, I think I think Michelle Yeoh was in this. Um, yeah. It's uh, Danny Boyle directed Ooh. with a... John Murphy score that you have heard, even if you don't know you've heard it, because it was used and still is used in so many film trailers. Cool. Well, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. I've never mm -hmm. seen that one before. Um, so, looking forward to that. So, uh, that is next Wednesday. Um, go to filmseizure.com. You can find uh, all the places you can subscribe to us to, to get that uh, podcast delivered straight to your ear holes and then you can also find all of the places on social media that you can follow us as well this upcoming monday on monster mondays again we're off world i'm making good on something i said in a previous episode a couple of years back um and it's time to uh, take a look at those star trek next generation borg episodes and so we Lord. kick things off with Q Who. So that's this upcoming Monday, August 5th. Q Who. Any party Borgs going to be there for that? No. No. Party Borgs. No party okay. Borgs. They hardly got uh, any play on the on the season of B-Movie and with the series. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's okay. They'll be back. You no, know they're out there. That's the thing, you know. I know. That's the, the thing. Org is they're out there. Out there. Yeah. Now, now, I might eventually ruin them. Much like Star Trek would eventually <laughs> ruin the board, but they're out there, you know, they're out there somewhere anyway. So, uh, yeah, so that is this upcoming Monday on uh, Monster Mondays, same place, filmseizure.com, all that good stuff. You can find out when that drops. This upcoming Friday at my website, uh, bmovieanima.com, we have the review of the post apocalyptic sci fi movie. Man, everything's sci fi here. Um, Ravagers. And uh, Ravagers is a movie that's almost great. It's almost great. It's almost great. Not familiar. Well, it's interesting, at least. So I recommend it. Uh, 
Um, and then this Saturday on uh, B Movie Anima, the series, the new episode has the Hoff in it. Terror at London Bridge, which is a uh, David Hasselhoff ends up chasing down <laughs> fucking Jack the Ripper. It's great. It's great. Oh, that's great. Uh, but it takes place in present day. <laughs> Anyway, oh, that's great. don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's great. It's great. <laughs> All right. So uh, until next week, when we uh, get ourselves a big fat tan from that sunshine, <laughs> I'm Jeff Harbuckle. I'm the chucking. <laughs> I'm, I guess, the horse. <laughs> the, 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 the what? The <laughs> You've been listening to Film Seizure. <laughs>